Hello and welcome to The Painting Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremiah Polachek, your co-pilot on the pathway to becoming a better painter. Today we're going to be talking about the concept of the muse, the elusive force that drives us all to create. Will the muse show up during the creation of this episode? Stay around to find out. Let's get into it. O oh, divine poesy, goddess, daughter of Zeus, sustain me for this song of the various minded man who, after he had plundered the innermost citadel of hallowed Troy, was made to stay grievously about the coasts of men, the sport of their customs, good and bad, while his heart, through all the seafaring, ached with an agony to redeem himself and bring his company safe home. Vain hope for them, for his fellows he strove in vain. By their own witlessness they were cast aside to destroy for meat the oxen of the most exalted sun. Wherefore the sun god blotted out the day of their return. Make this tale live for us in all its many bearings, O oh, Muse. So what is exactly going on in this poem? That's Homer, by the way, in uh, the beginning of the Iliad. And Homer is calling upon the Muse to help him tell the story of the anger of Achilles and its devastating consequences during the Trojan War. And this invocation really highlights the importance of divine inspiration in retelling these heroic things and the tragic events of the past. So Homer is basically beginning his poem, and this is common for a lot of epic poems, with an invocation of the muse, or he's appealing to the muse, basically saying, help me write this story. I can't write this story by myself. I need some help. And for Homer, this wasn't anything new. This had been going on for centuries beforehand, uh, mostly through an oral tradition of storytelling, somebody would begin a story by invoking the muse and uh, asking for their help in retelling events. And there's a couple different reasons why somebody would do this. You know, when you're starting off a story by making a call to the goddesses, there's more than one muse, by the way, we should say the muses, and they were known for giving uh, aid to other things besides the arts and writing. It was also important for science. So when people were studying science, they could also begin their endeavors for the day by invoking the muse and asking for their help. And these, these are Greek goddesses. They have actual names. I won't go through all of them. There's nine of them. But these were actual Greek goddesses that you could call out directly. So imagine that you're sitting in a pub You've got your beer in your hand, and the old storyteller comes and sits down at your table. You're ready to hear a great story and drink some beer. And they begin their story with this invocation of the muse. Now, this is going to tell you, as you're, you know, as you sit there, this is going to tell you that the person telling the story is kind of a conduit for something else, and that this story is bigger than just this one storyteller that's sitting there. And it kind of sets the scene for what's to come. And we should remember that this is not only pertaining to the listener of the story, the person sitting there in the pub, but also the storyteller themselves. And that's a, a good distinction to make. And how the Homer is invoking the muse at the beginning of the Iliad, it, it serves two purposes. One for the listener or the reader, and the other for the writer. And why would a writer need this invocation of the muse when they're creating as well? You know, Homer is considered to be pretty good, you know, he's considered to be okay at what he does. So he doesn't come out there, you know, like a rock star and be like, look at me, I am the center of attention, all eyes on me, right? This is my story. No, he's not doing that. He's saying, I need help with this story. And like I said before, this is something that was already common in oral traditions. So he's kind of simultaneously, you know, giving himself some authority, you know, basically saying that he has a connection to the goddesses that are going to help him retell this tale. But it also connects him directly to tradition. And he's basically saying, look, I'm going to start this the way everybody else does. And I'm just, like I said before, a conduit for a greater purpose and a greater power. And it, you know, it alludes to this sort of divine intervention and this elusive 
and ethereal connection to creativity and writing. And that's why we're so interested in it. As painters, oftentimes we have to go back to the studio every single day and create some sort of artistic practice, right? In if you ever go to art school, you're going to hear this term. What is your artistic practice? And it's very rarely spoken about. You know, you could say my research involves researching the frog penguin, which I see as a symbol of hybrid identity and adaptability. And I find its echoes in sensory experiences that involve me squishing jello with my toes. Right? You could, in like, what the hell does that mean? That that's that's your research stuff. That's not a practice, right? That's like the content of what you're doing. But what is your practice? What do you do? How do you wake up in the morning and go to the studio? When you sit down in the studio, what do you do before you work? So when we're talking about artistic practice, I think it's important to. Speak directly to what is a person doing. If you go to the gym, you're going to go to the gym and you're going to work out on this machine first, and then go on this machine, and you can create a series of things that you do that becomes your practice at the gym. And after a while, that becomes habit, and then your muscles start getting stronger, right? And it's this habit done daily which allows for the muse to come in. There's a really good book by a woman named Twyla. Tharp, who's a well-known choreographer, and the book is called *The Creative Habit: Learn It and Use It for Life*. And in this book,、uh, Tharp goes into her own experiences, and she shows how creativity can be cultivated as a habit rather than just waiting for inspiration to strike. So, a lot of times when we're taught about art in art making, we're taught about this aha moment where suddenly everything comes into focus. And those moments do occur occasionally, but you also have to set the scene for those things to happen. So Twyla, in her book, goes through some different key points and insights, which you know demonstrate how you can create this environment so you can make these things occur. How can you invite the muse into your studio? And in the book, Twyla talks about how every single morning she gets up and she works out for two hours. So she goes to the gym for two hours before she's going to be doing choreography all day long, right? So she's got a whole day ahead of her. She's got a lot of stuff that she needs to do physically,、uh, demanding of her body as well. But she still starts off her day with a two-hour workout. Now, what's interesting about this is when she says she feels as if her day starts. It's not when she sits down in the studio or in the gym. It's when she finally is able to sit in a cab. She has to hail a cab. To get to the gym, and the moment she really feels like her day has begun is when she gets into that taxi, and it's here where she can begin to mentally prepare herself for what's to come. So she does her two-hour workout, and then she's got to go to the dance studio where she's going to work. But she's already warmed up. She's not, you know, fresh off the subway into the the dance studio. And all right, here we got to do this. You got to go over. I don't know what choreographers do.、Um, You know, jump more like this or something, but she's not coming in completely cold. She has a warm up. She has something that's got her brain going, other than coffee. And this is something that applies to a lot of different disciplines. Could be art, you know, painting, sculpture, or creating an app. Whatever that you're doing, that's some sort of creative pursuit that takes daily work. Is the fact. That you're allowing for the muse to come in and basically work their magic. Because if we think about it, where do ideas really come from? Where do we get ideas? How does an idea come into our mind? It's kind of like magic. And Rick Rubin, who's a really influential producer, music producer, who's worked with everyone from Slayer to the Beastie Boys, actually wrote a book called "The Creative Act: A Way of Being." And in this book. He really presents creativity not as something you know that's momentary and just a burst of inspiration, like I talked about that aha moment before, but rather as a sustained way of engaging with the world. And he really emphasizes the importance of openness, curiosity, and presence or mindfulness as the foundation to a creative life. And this can be very difficult, obviously, because. It's very hard to make a living as an artist, whether it's a musician or an actor 
or a painter, it's it's very difficult. So the people that have access to living, you know, this creative way of life often have to make sacrifices in order to do so. Because if time is money, then it takes a lot of money to make something creative because you've got to give yourself the opportunity to do so. And if you're working nine to five every day, that's going to drain a lot of your brain power. But regardless, when we're looking at Rick Rubin and his approach to how he sets a scene where creativity can flourish, he essentially, he says that he doesn't know a lot about music, you know, in the way he listens to music a lot. But theoretically, he's not exactly well-versed in music. And he says the most important thing that he does is making artists feel comfortable and confident and allowing them to access and express their deepest creative impulses and get that on tape so he can capture that magic. So we're talking about the muse previously in the terms of Homer relating the muse to the listener or the reader of a story as well as how it pertains to the writer of a story. Here we see the muse used by somebody who's creating an environment, a studio, bringing musicians into his studio, and he's got to create that environment for those mu musicians. And it's not a mistake that we see a similarity in words there, is it? Muse, musician. What is a musician doing? What is a musician doing when they're improvising? What does a musician do? What, what does Beethoven do when he sits down at a piano and starts plonking away at the keys? What exactly is happening? Is he thinking about, I need to go from A minor to B flat here? No, he's relying on his intuition and he's allowing the magic to happen. And a lot of times people are going to get creative blocks. I'm sure there's a thousand different YouTube videos about how to overcome your art creative block. And a really simple approach to overcome it, unfortunately, is very boring and kind of hard. But Ruben says that the best way to overcome these blocks is to simply consistently work. And you can look more into uh, Rick Rubin himself talking about these ideas if you look for the YouTube video when he's on the Joe Rogan show talking about it. But essentially he says that these, this magic and these ideas are available to everybody. So there's kind of a democratization that happens. It, it takes the artist off the pedestal where they have the unique vision of the world and everybody else is a sheep, right? He says that these ideas are available to everybody and anybody can access them if they open themselves up to a practice which allows it. And this is something that is very rarely, I think at least, very rarely spoken about in art schools. As I said before, when we talk about practice or when we look up artist statements about their artistic practice, it's usually a lot of nonsense. And there's not a lot of stories that speak directly to what the person does in order to cultivate an environment that is conducive to creativity. And like I said before, there are some valid criticism of this model and this approach because, you know, if we start equating hard work with success, you know, it can be an oversimplification that hard work is always going to lead to success because there's other factors at play as well. Like I said before, having money is going to obviously give you more access to being able to live this type of creative life. So there are factors such as privilege and access to resources, systemic inequalities that are going to give some people an advantage over others. But we're talking about art school here, right? So if you're in art school, you have already said to yourself that you're going to give yourself this time every single week for painting class, every single week for drawing class, every single week for sculpture, whatever it is, you've already decided to devote this time. So that's why I think it is imperative to speak about these sort of things in an art school context to give people these tools to create an artistic practice. Because if they go into art school, and art school is full of rich kids, that's there's no doubt about that, but if you're in art school, you have the privilege to already get to art school you might as well be taught how to actually create a process that can help you creatively make work that allows you to speak with your unique voice. Because like I said before, there is some valid criticisms of this idea of hustle culture or hard work and who's allowed to work hard and all these sorts of things. And, you know, are we glorifying hard work in the form of these long hours and personal sacrifice that's detrimental to our mental health and well-being. We've all heard of that for artists, right? 
So you can emphasize the importance of a work-life balance, or, you know, oftentimes this concept of hard work can be exploited by certain employers who want you to think that hard work is going to pay off. But the thing is, if you don't work hard, you're, you're not going to have any chance at the same time. So I understand the criticisms of the so-called hard work, and people complain that, you know, Gen Z doesn't want to work. Gen Z doesn't know how to do hard work. My grandpa used to throw hay bales from five in the morning, right? There, there is that criticism of Gen Z, you know, they, they don't want to work. But at the same time, there are some truth in that, that, that they're probably being taken advantage of in certain respects as well. But regardless of what you think about that, what I'm talking about is how to cultivate an artistic practice that allows for, you know, new revelations, new insights, and creativity in general. And this is across the board when you look at a lot of different books and a lot of different articles written about creativity and how we create that environment that allows it to flourish. And this is really difficult in dealing with art students because it goes a little bit deeper, and I don't think there's a lot of fields of study that I'm aware of that tap into it in this sort of way where you're dealing with a student that really has to be very vulnerable and open to failure, hopefully, but they've got their ego that's yapping away, telling them to, you know, be more careful, you're going to look stupid, these sorts of things. So how do we deal with art students and speaking to them about tapping into this sort of creative force that isn't necessarily themselves? It's not necessarily them. We're kind of taking a little bit of agency away from them as somebody who's making and telling them to tap into something that they're not fully in control of. You know, Seth Godin is, you know, I guess a, an author and thinker and uh, well known for his book Purple Cow and a couple other things. But he talks about the idea of resistance and what causes us to stop acting on a creative idea that we have. Why do we have these creati creative ideas and when we get them, at the moment, we think this is a great idea. And then in a couple hours, we're like, oh, that's a really dumb idea. You know, so what is going on with our mind and our psychology to make us stop from acting on this idea? Now, a, a different approach to this would be Stephen King, who I brought up before. And Stephen King has famously said he, he doesn't write down these ideas. You know, a lot of times novelists will carry a book around with them and they'll write down their ideas as they get them. Famously, Ray Bradbury would go on walks, you know, in order to come up with ideas for his books. And then you write them down in your little notebook. But Stephen King would say that, I don't want to write these ideas down immediately. I want them to just stick around in my head and then the good ideas will stay. And there's a lot of bad ideas as well. So there is an editing process, of course, that should go on and you shouldn't just act on absolutely every single creative impulse that you have. But a lot of times... People in art programs are so afraid of failure that it makes it impossible for them to innovate and find their own creative voice. And this subject was taken on directly by Stephen Pressfield in his book, The War of Art. And he, he talks about resistance in a different way. And he says that resistance is universal. Everybody experiences resistance. And it is particularly strong when we're trying to do something meaningful or creative. So how do we deal with this? We deal this. So how do we deal with this? We deal with it by adopting a professional mindset and discipline that is going to be key to overcoming this resistance. We also need to acknowledge the role of a higher self of some form. So if we're going to achieve true creative expression, we're going to have to tap into some sort of higher consciousness beyond resistance itself. And by acknowledging that resistance and this fear of embarrassment or this fear of falling on our faces, again, we kind of democratize the process of making art, just like Homer did when he begins the Iliad with a call to the muses to help him out. And I want to be really careful here because I don't want people to think of art as, you know, we're Novartis and we've got to launch our new app, so we're going to get our team together and we're going to do this. And, you know, I don't want art to become this corporate, you know, mechanized way of creating. I think that there's a coldness in a lot of that that's going to prohibit these ideas as well. So a lot of these things are really about navigating and finding your own way. And previously I spoke about these aha moments versus this idea of having 
consistent creative work and a creative process, but it also involves really seeing the world in a different way and allowing for these ideas to bubble in. And maybe you do get inspiration when you're buying some gum at a gas station. That's completely possible. You know, for instance, Brian Eno, who's considered the creator of ambient music, said he came up with the idea one day when he was in his apartment and he had a record which was playing that was on very low volume of some violins and it was raining outside and he could hear the street sounds as well. And there wasn't one sound that was trying to overshadow any of the other sounds. They were all kind of blending into each other as a soundscape. And this idea where no sound has supremacy and you've got rain, natural sounds, you've got the sounds of the cars on the streets, and you've also got this violin is the impetus for the creation of ambient music. And of course, after this, he would, he actually creates the term ambient for this type of music, but he would go on, I think it's 1978 or so, he would create the album Music for Airports, which is still used all over the place to this day. But what was the circumstance that allowed him to hear the cars and hear the rain and hear the record playing and put all those things together and say, I'm listening to something different. Where did that idea come from? Was that due to some invocation and some strict schedule that was adhered to? No, not necessarily. It was related to his ability to listen. And he had become very, very good simply at listening and experiencing and thinking. So this can go back to a creative way of life and a creative way of viewing the world. When you get those ideas, I would suggest writing them down and editing them and figuring out which ones are good ideas and which ones are bad ideas. And we don't need to hold ourselves up to the standard where we create an entirely new genre of music while listening to the raindrops outside. But imagine for a moment if Brian Eno's ego, Brian Eno's ego, that would be a great indie band, but if Brian Eno's ego had got in the way and told him to stop and be like, why are you, you're putting car sounds in an album? You care about the rain as much as you care about the sound of the violin? That's dumb. Why would you do that? Imagine if he was stopped by his ego. So the muse in this respect presented this idea and he decided to keep that idea and expand upon it and study it. And it didn't happen immediately. It took time. You had to figure out, is this ambient? What does this sound like? I got to turn down this synthesizer all these sorts of things. It didn't just immediately materialize. It still took work after that initial idea was planted. And there's probably a reason why this is often not talked about in the visual arts, in an art school environment, and that's because it has this kind of woo-woo, new age component to it as well. But we've all experienced some sort of of synchronicity, right? We've all had synchronicities come up in our lives where like, we're like, how is that possible that I met this person here? Whatever it is. And when we t start talking about synchronicity, it often kind of correlates to this idea of the muse or this idea of getting sudden inspiration or an idea or Brian Eno sitting in his apartment listening to the rain outside mixed with the sounds of the violin. There's kind of an intersection between the material world and the psyche. And there's some sort of interconnectedness between them both. And this suggests that there's a layer of reality where there's boundaries between the internal and external world that are getting broken down. And there's a bit of a distinction that I think can be made between the muse and synchronicity. But both kind of, you know, suggest that creative inspiration comes from beyond the rational mind. You know, the muse kind of implies that there's this external force of inspiration and synchronicity points more to this alignment of these internal and external worlds where your internal state begins to resonate with these events that are happening outside. And there's some sort of meaningful coincidence that sparks this creativity. That is Brian Eno in his apartment. The muse can be a symbol of inspiration, but it can also be linked to the unconscious processes that feed this creative act. And there can be a convergence of these ideas coming together that show the deeper layers of the psyche, and this can lead to very profound creative breakthroughs. Now we have to think about what is a meaningful connection, right? Because everybody has different meaningful connections. Everybody will see things in different ways. And we have to 
you know, somehow pay attention to what is a meaningful connection. Not everything is going to be, right? We can see ideas and symbols or certain events happening all around us all the time. So how do we point to the ones that are meaningful? And this involves transcending the ego. You have to transcend the ego. We go back to Seth Godin and this idea of, you know, the lizard brain stopping you, your ego stopping you. You're going to be stupid. You're going to fall on your face. But synchronicity cuts through all of that. And it's the collective unconscious that suggests creativity is going to involve transcending your individual ego in order to tap in to these universal themes and archetypes, have a channel through which these universal forces will flow. And this is a really hard thing to teach. If you're in an art school environment, you're going to want to do your best to teach people, you know, how to research or how to do some certain technique, or this is how you prepare your canvas, all these sort of technical things we get focused on. But how do you actually teach these concepts? We can make people aware of them. We can bring them up in class. But at the end of the day, it's up to them to implement it in their own lives and utilize it as part of their own creative toolbox that they can employ in the creation of their work. And there's different resistance that I didn't even talk about that we run into as well. And they don't involve our ego. They simply involve our phones. If you're going to immerse yourself in some sort of creative process, the first thing you're going to have to do is literally shut your phone off, shut off your notifications, turn your sound off, put your phone somewhere else. Don't let it interrupt you. All, every single app on your phone wants your attention. Every single app on your phone that's active while you're trying to engage in some sort of creative pursuit is actively putting up a giant barrier that stops the muse from entering into your studio. And this isn't just a criticism of Gen Z who doesn't know anything about hard work. Gen Z doesn't know anything about hard work. No, this isn't just you know, some criticism of Gen Z, but society in general, we often don't have a lot of quiet time anymore because of we're so conditioned. I read the other day that the average American checks their phone once every seven minutes. Imagine if you had some other addiction that you had to do every seven minutes. Even if you were smoking cigarettes and every seven minutes you needed a cigarette, that's a lot of cigarettes every day, right? So just be aware, be aware of this digital barrage that wants to take your attention off of what you are trying to accomplish. It's a focus issue and it's one that goes bing, 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 bing while you're in the studio. Shut it off. The next thing I would suggest you do is identify what your warm up is. Whatever you're doing, if you're painting, how do you sit down in the studio and warm up before you begin painting? Don't just sit down in the studio, smoke a bong bowl and put on, you know, Piers Morgan or something, right? That would be awful. Um, don't do that no matter what. <laughs> it's a bad idea. But when you sit down in your studio, just be aware of how do you start? How do you warm up? What do you do? Maybe you're mixing colors and you're just going to mix some different piles of colors. Maybe you're looking at inspiration. You're looking at some art books or whatever. But identify what is that warm-up period and how can you incorporate it into your own artistic practice. And this can be something completely unrelated to painting. It can be the hailing a cab moment. It can be the moment you have your morning coffee and think about something or whatever it is, but identify it and nurture it. And the last thing would be to be aware of your ego telling you that stuff is a bad idea. Embrace failure. And by embracing failure, you're going to have a better chance of really finding your own artistic voice. So I hope these things have helped you uh, shed some light on the creative process and some real hands-on things that you can do to further enhance your own studio experience and cultivating your own artistic practice. If you're into this sort of thing, head on over to oko.academy where you can learn more about my tiny art school in Prague where I teach people how to paint and draw and become more creative and achieve their goals. You can come to Prague and you can take some lessons with me in real life. I do do some uh, online lessons as well. So don't feel free to contact me if you want to expand your horizons and get more in touch with what it is that you want to create and how painting can be part of that journey. Thanks a lot for listening. I'm Jeremiah Polachek, and as always, happy painting.